something is supposed to be natural, but it doesn't feel natural because it's beyond nature. It's not something that you could you could just pass off. When you say something that is supernatural, you don't pass by supernatural and assume it's a normal thing. You just see there's something different about this thing. It's natural, but there is a super attached to it. So, like your everyday life, you go to work. That's a natural thing. But when certain things happen at work that is beyond nature, so that has become super natural. And last week, I was, God was talking to me about, you know, working in the supernatural. And God told me, you know what, you can actually constantly create the supernatural. And I asked God, how do I get to do that? God said, everything you do that you consider spiritual, make it natural. And I will make everything you consider natural to be supernatural. So I asked, what, what does that mean? God asked me, what are the things you call so spiritual? I said, like, praying. And God said, when you make a prayer a natural thing, I will make all the natural things that you do to become a supernatural thing. So it's like we are exchanging energy. I'm, I'm bringing your natural world into my own world because you're bringing what is natural to me into your own natural world. God said, what else do you see as a spiritual activity? I said, studying the word of God. When I'm studying, I see that a spiritual thing I'm doing. God says, begin to make a study of the word natural. Do it organically. Let it be part of you. Let it be something that you know you need to do. It's not something that, oh, I think I should do. But just like you eat every day, just like you drink water every day, just like you go to work every day, make study of the Word of God a daily process. Let it be part of you. Let it be something that you cannot live without. And then I will bring the supernatural into your own natural world. He asked again, what else are the spiritual things you do? I said, I love to worship God. If I sing sometimes, but I love to worship God. God says, if worship can become organic to you. I will bring my own supernatural world into your natural world so that every other thing you're doing, you'll begin to experience something that is beyond nature. Something that people can explain away. If only you can decide, okay, I want to make this part of my life. He asked again, he said, what else do you do? And it was funny because there, if he told, asked me, all the natural things I do, I wouldn't even blink my eyes. I would just start naming them. But when it comes to now the spiritual things I do, I needed to kind of think about them a little bit deeper. And he said, what else? And I said, oh, I go to church. And whenever I go to church, I go and refuel myself. I go and recharge myself. Not only do I preach in church, I get to stay more on the word of God so I can hear God. And God said, that is something you call spiritual. Is it possible for you to make it a natural thing? Can it come natural to you when you tell yourself, oh, this is part of my program. Nothing can interrupt it. I can't say, oh, I have other things I want to do. I have to go to the house of God. It becomes natural to me. He says, if that becomes natural to you, you're going to work, your business, and every other thing you do, I will make them to become supernatural. So, creating the supernatural means 
taking your spiritual activity and the, your spirituality, making it natural, and then all the natural things you do, your feeding, your going to work, your, your reading, become super natural. I tell people this all the time, especially students. I say when I'm reading and I'm so tired of reading, and I'm no more assimilating anything. All I do is I close the book and open the Bible and read. And then I close the Bible and open the book. And the, the, the book starts coming alive to me. Why? What I have done is I created, I make something spiritual. I brought it into the natural realm. And now God takes what I was doing naturally, brings it to a supernatural realm. And then we kind of exchanged energy. We met at a point. And we started doing what we, you know, what we're supposed to do. I told my daughter once, uh, it was a week. I didn't have so much clients. And I asked, I told her, do you notice I didn't have so much clients? She said, yes. I said, because I didn't do anything spiritual. So I was just living. Because I was a bit tired and I wanted to rest. So I wasn't doing anything. I said, well, we really need some money next week. So we need to get some clients now. So I said, each time I want clients, I know what I do. So I bring the spiritual realm, I bring it into my natural life, and then God takes whatever I do naturally and takes it. And so that week, I started having, I've not even said amen when my, my phone started kind of lighting up. So I knew people wanted to book sessions. And people started booking the moment I finished praying. What happened is God took what I do in the natural realm brought it to his own realm and made it supernatural. You can you can create a supernatural in your life every time and every day. Just convert those things you call, oh my God, and being spiritual and make it evangelizing, you know, witnessing to people and talking to them about Christ is a spiritual thing. Because that's an assignment. If, you be, if it becomes part of your life, a natural thing, God takes, you know, you, you're talking about God, God starts talking about you. There's a reverse. You're telling people about God, and then people will start talking about you in different places that they, you, just, you just become needed. Why? Because you make people believe they need God, and as much as the moment they believe, you know, in God, people start believing in you. And just as I'm talking, and something came to my mind. I was reading about how to monetize on YouTube. And the impression a lot of people have is if you have many, you know, you have a lot of subscribers, you know, which is important, you have um, uh, videos, you know, automatically you start getting paid. No, you get paid by reason of the adverts that they put in there. Now, it's not even enough for there to be adverts on your video. You get paid by the clicks and the response because there are a lot of times you're watching um, a video, a YouTube video, and an advert comes and you, you put skip because you're not interested in that advert. The owner of the video doesn't get paid because you did not click. So what you're saying is we want to exchange something. Okay, you put your video there. We put our own video there. If through your video this gets you know paid and then we get to pay you as well. So that's the same thing we do you know, we are praying and God saying, okay, now you're doing something in the natural world. Let me get to do something in your own world. Let me pick something you do and let me just convert it. And so when people tell me things that are not working, I'm like, but they're working for me. How come they're not working for you? And God said, it's not, it can't work for them because all they're doing is they're basking in their natural world. And they don't give me an opportunity for the exchange. I can't create something supernatural for them because they, they are working so hard 
on their natural world and forgetting that you can't create supernatural when you work hard. Because even if you make so much money, see, you, you don't, you're not still content because you worked hard for it. It didn't, it, it didn't fall on your laps. It's not like you working a little bit and then getting reference and things start exploding and people accept whatever price. That is the supernatural. When you get much more than you put in, it's the supernatural. Creating the supernatural. Now there's, there's seven scriptures that I want to share. John 6, 16 to 21. The Bible says that when evening came, this was after Jesus had you know, fed the multitude. When the evening now came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. Now, I just want us to see this like in a, in a physical world. Evening came and the disciples decided to go fishing. That's the job. And they were just in the boat. It was now dark and Jesus was not yet come to them. Sometimes when you are in the natural world, it can be in a relationship, it can be at your job, it can be at the study or something. You are in a boat. So see it as a boat. This life is like a boat. We are all in a boat. Sometimes and most times it gets dark. Life just gets dark. Even when you know to do what you're doing well, darkness comes. It just falls on you. I remember uh, three years ago, usually the way of my, our, our, my major works is you go to school, you graduate after your master's. You can't work with your master's in marriage and family therapy that I did, if you, or if you did counseling or psychology. You can't, you can't do it and go to work, right? So I was like, I didn't know that before, because I was thinking, why would I spend two, three, two to three years doing something and I can't even use it to work? So it's, they, they train you to take the licensure exam. That's what that is for. Now, I did, I'm someone that loves, I love instant so much. I love modules, I love shortcuts. I'm always thinking about how best to do certain things at the shortest possible time. But the truth of the matter is, there is no shortcuts in life. Anything you miss, to, you fail to do, you come back to repeat it. And we don't do that well. And so I did whatever I did. To, I did it, everybody did like three years ago. I did two and a half years. And then it was time to take the licensure exam. And I, you know, I bought materials. I started reading and discovered while I was reading there were certain things because I didn't do my undergrad, I didn't do psychology, which is a, a major part of it. I don't know why you know, we admit people into um, a mental health you know, master's program without a psychology background. I think they just wanted to diversify. It's, it's not like law where you, they tell you they do uh, you can, you can do engineering and not go to law school as long as you can pass the law set. It's not like that. This is, you're, you're dealing with lives here and there are many things you need to know. And so when I started reading, I discovered, oh my God, there's several steps that have been skipped. I don't know certain things, but I did my best. And so I know I'm a very bright person. I mean, with a, with a false degree in, in engineering it's not easy to go through engineering program when i did the first licensure exam i failed and when i failed i thought i was not i thought they were wrong because i i i never failed I, it it came to me as a surprise 
Why would I sit for an exam and fail? And God told me, in this life, people fail. And so, if you think you've never failed an exam, take that as the first experience, which is okay. And I felt a bit bitter about it. And so I said, okay, I'm not going to take the second exam for granted. That was like my evening. And that was a boat I got into. And then I took the second time. And then I failed. And I thought this was a joke. This must be a joke. I couldn't Google it. I was, you know, I went to Google to find out, you know, the failure rates and things like that. And I was shocked. When I went to certain website, they said the people who prepared for uh, a year for the exam, they always pass. The people who prepare six months for the exam, they have like, I think, 80, 7 to 80 percent rates of pass. The people who prepared for three months, they said they're like, like 20 percent pass. Of course, I belong to that group. Because I love instant. When it's almost time for exam, and then I dive in and start waiting to make sure, yeah, we go into this thing, we must pass it. So I felt it. I said, okay, so I need to prepare more for the exam. And so this time around, I gave myself time, and I was sure I was going to pass it. I bought CDs, and so each time I'm driving, I'm listening to, you know, tapes. Even though while I was listening. I discovered that everything I was listening to, I never saw those things on the exam. But I just felt, well, maybe this time around, I just needed to listen more. And so I was so sure. So I went in the third time, you know, and when I came out, I said, I'm done with this thing. You know, maybe I should go and throw away all the materials. And when the results came, I failed. Now, I knew I was dealing with something that was more than me. I needed the supernatural now. I went into exam believing it's it passing comes natural to me. I don't I don't I don't start anything to fail. There is absolutely nothing so I give my best. I I I do whatever it takes to make sure I pass. And so I was like okay God what's going on here, and God said, you are read, but it's not of him that we let nor run it, it's of God assured mercy. There's seven things that you will do, but you will still need my factor. There are many things that could have been going on while I was, while they were marking your script. Some people are, were angry. Some people, you may just make a first sentence and somebody may look at you and say, this, this looks arrogant. There are times that, you know, I, I have kids who mark script and I hear things they say about people who sit down for exam. You know, my daughter said one day, you know, she was marking the script and looked at it and read and said, this person is not serious and just failed the person. I said, wait, 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 hold on. Are you saying that's the way they mark my scripts too? And she, she laughed. She said, oh, once you've done your exam, the power belongs to the marker. <laughs> Your life, your destiny, somebody just sits down there and just decides of what happens to you next. That's why you need God. Because the heart of a king is in the hands of God. What am I saying? The Bible says, and Jesus had not yet come to them and it was dark. And so whenever dark things are happening in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship, in your career, it simply means that Jesus has not yet come into that vault. It's an indication. People will say, but I go to church. Yeah, you went to church, you didn't take God back home with you. Why? Because you went to church as a spiritual thing. Going to church was for you something I do sometimes. It's not something that comes natural to you. Back in, back in the day when I gave my life to Christ, I never saw a particular day as a fellowship day. You know, sometimes you just go to church. There's really nothing happening there. You just go to church. It becomes like a, a way of life. 
to you, or sometimes you are asking yourself, what else are they doing in church tomorrow? You want to know what's going on there. Not because there's really, because there are even times I go to church doing main service, and I'm already there like two hours before the service. And when all this starts, I go into the auditorium. It's not just that I get bored. I just love to be in church. That's it. It was just natural. And then now that I think about it, there are a lot of things that became supernatural. For instance, I was never sick. I never had to go to the hospital for anything whatsoever. Why? Because I was working in the supernatural. Because my not, the spiritual things were brought into my natural world. They became me. So if somebody wanted to look for me, they would rather go to church to find me than to ask for my address. Because they always know they will see me. So if I have a message, you know, from somebody, somebody, they just say, oh, I'll see her in church tomorrow, most likely. They don't need a text to say, will you be coming? So when it comes to a point where people need to be sure if you're going to be there or not, that means it's no longer your, your, in your world. People don't call me at certain times of the day because it is natural for me to wake up in the morning and see God first. There are people that drinking coffee has come natural to them. The first thing is, if you want to know where they are at certain times, like when people are talking to them, they can tell this, some, this person is drinking coffee. Because that's what this person does. Because it's Everybody knows what comes natural to you. They just know that this is what you do at certain times because it comes natural to you. People should know, like people don't, you can't tell me to come to do anything on a Sunday morning. If you say something is going on somewhere and I ask you when is, when is it going to happen and you're not telling me Sunday morning, of course you know that you're giving me an invitation that I'm not attending. It, because it just comes natural to me. And I am not somebody that goes to church because I want to teach. It's just, I've been here several times and there were only six. And I'm do, I was doing exactly what I'm doing now. I mean, she knows. She be wondering sometimes, what is the noise about? <laughs> Because it comes natural. I have been doing this for years. I was doing it back in Nigeria. I started in Nigeria when nobody was coming. I continued when people started coming. And God took me away from Nigeria, brought me to a place where the people that were coming were no longer here. And I continued what I was doing. It comes natural to me. Many years ago, when my kids, when my, my young adults were kids, I used to go to church and I used to get there at 5.30 a.m. Because I was in charge of the choir and choir practice starts at 6 a.m. So my choir did not have this excuse of, oh, I don't know the lyrics because I wasn't in church during the week. No, there's always the last chance. And that last chance is on a Sunday morning. They come on Sunday morning and we are rehearsing. And where do I live? I was living like, I used to take three buses and I had two kids. And so one would be behind me. You know, I, I had another sister that, you know, used to help out. She, she had nothing to do with the choir, but she had to get to church at 5.30, just like me. And so when we got there, we get there, we normally prepare the whole place, you know. We, we check the sound, we check, just like what I do here. Check, I come here, check the sound, put on the AC, put on the lights, you know, arrange the chairs, set up the cameras, do everything. So it, 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 it was a natural thing to do. It became part of me. And so I, it, I've never come to a point in my life where on a Sunday morning I will fix like a travel. It, it can't even happen. Because that is a spiritual thing that I brought into my natural world. So that God can take my natural world, 
my marriage, my children. It can take them into the spiritual world. And so I can constantly experience the supernatural. It's an exchange of energy. Supernatural only happens when you exchange energy with the spiritual. You take everything that is natural to you, you let the spiritual take over it, and then you take what is spiritual, you bring it into your natural world. The Bible says they were in a boat and it became dark. Darkness is not something that is that you need to fret about because you know what to do you get into a room and it's dark i mean you look for the switch even if you've never been to that place the first thing you look out for is you start looking at the wall everybody does that when you go into a room you go into you ask somebody where's your bathroom you get into the bathroom you're looking around what are you looking for switch you want to illuminate that place that's what we all look for. So when there is a darkness in your life, you should look for a switch. You don't argue with darkness. And darkness means something that is not making you move forward. Because whenever you are dark, or whenever the place is dark, you can't do certain things. You are incapacitated. You can't move forward. You're not growing. You're, you're just there. So you want to illuminate that environment. The Bible says it was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. 18. And the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Strong wind will always blow against your job. It will blow against your marriage. It will blow against your growth. It will blow against your career. Strong winds are always there. Things will not always go smoothly in this world where we are. Why? Because we're in a natural world. The only way you want to stop the strong wind from interrupting what you're doing is by exchange program. Let the supernatural take care of the natural thing by you bringing the spiritual into your natural world. Everything you do that is spiritual, make them natural. Pray. Let prayer become organic. Let study of the word become normal to you. Let coming to church become organic. Let nothing take the place of the spirituality in your life. Let it become me. That is what I do. Before I sleep, my iPad is by my bed and it's already on my Bible. So when I open my iPad, you know, when you're your bed, they tell you the, the things you know how to do. All the sites just come up. The first thing that comes up on my, my iPad is the Bible. What, I, what is the first thing that comes up on your own, bike, on your own iPad? On your phone. Because that is the natural thing I do so that the supernatural can happen in my life. I want every day of my life to become supernatural. I went to, I was in the bathroom like three days ago, and for the first time, I know there are people that have migraine constantly. And I know it's not, it's not fun, it's not joke, it's not joke. And so I got into the bathroom and the, my hair just hit. I, 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 my, my vision became blurred. And somebody will say, oh, it happens. It's a natural thing, right? And so if I wanted to do something natural to it, I should pick like a painkiller and take it. I said, it's time for an exchange program right now. So. I got up. I started, I took scriptures and I started speaking into the air. I said, I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Anything that tries to defile this temple will be destroyed. I carry God inside of me so I can't have all sicknesses. 
inside his body. I don't know what is going wrong, but whatever is going wrong is strange to this body. And I'll speak to strangers, and strangers will hear my voice, and they will run out of their hiding places. Why? By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed of the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. So I started those scriptures, and all of a sudden, it disappeared. Exchange program. If I started running around to do the natural thing, of course, the next thing I want to do is to maybe call my doctor or Google what has just happened. The moment you keep basking in the natural, you can't create the supernatural. You can't. I knew there had to be an exchange program. My daughter went yesterday, and water is not really her friend. And she, she went to the splash platform, and when she came back, of course, she came down with something. So she told me, she said, I, Mom, I, I'm not feeling you know, comfortable. I said, OK, I'm coming. Let me just finish what I'm doing. After a while, she came and said, Mom, can we read the Bible? I said, all of a sudden, you remember my Bible now. <laughs> Can we read the Bible? I said, oh, that's good. So I did the field as I could because she hates, hates, hates medication. She wouldn't just take it. And so I did what I, I had to do. When she woke up this morning, she was walking everywhere in the house with her audio Bible. She went to the kitchen. So I was just hearing Bible, 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 Bible. She's in there today. Exchange program. You can create the supernatural. Many years ago, my daughter was came in the night and was screaming, yelling, my stomach, my stomach in the middle of the night. I, I hate being disturbed when I'm sleeping because I work so hard to daytime. I don't want anybody to interrupt it. My sleep. So I was like, ah. Uh, I told my husband, I said, please attend to her. I was just like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I was like, do what you've got to do. I just need to sleep. And so the noise continued, so I told her to come into the room. I took her to the bathroom. I told her to sit down in my bathroom. I got a stool in front of her, open to Psalm, Psalms 27. I said, this is it. Read it. Good night. I had not even, immediately she just started, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Boom. She did. <sighs> I'm also going to sleep. She became okay. I went to bed. It's an exchange program. If you don't make spirituality part of your program, it's hard for you to walk in the supernatural. I'm not saying just pray. I mean, let that prayer become a okay. Let it be what you do. That's how you roll. I don't do I this what I do, this is what I don't do. There are things that just come to me. Natural. My kids know that there are times they can't call because this time I'm studying. You can't call at that time. It's part of my program. If my alarm goes off sometimes when I'm talking to people, the, some people know why that alarm went off. It means it's time to read Psalms 27. I do it four times every day. Even when I'm driving, if it goes off, I'll just ask the Lord of my life to my salvation. Who shall I fear? It's something that is all natural to me. Why? Because until you make what you do here on earth, you, know, you bring God into it, it doesn't become so natural. So how you bring God into it is you take what belongs to the spiritual and bring it into your own world. And then God takes what is in your world and takes it to his own. So it's an exchange program. That's how you create the supernatural. I can tell you on and on and on and on the things that I've done in this my life that people will just say, it, sometimes it looks like a fairy tale, but it's not. I just say things like, this is how it happens, because this is what I do. If you want to have that supernatural in your life, you've got to do what you've got to do. The Bible says the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. It's not exclusive to you. Life can be tough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them in his eye, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And 
immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, they didn't say the, the storm stopped. They were still in the middle of the, of the sea. The Bible says immediately that boat skips the other journey and got to the end of it. Immediately, the boat landed. How did that happen? Jesus came to the boat. They didn't need to struggle anymore. They didn't need to keep rowing the boat. The boat appeared at their destination. God saves you time when you give him your time. Exchange program. He shortens the journey when you give him the trip. Because he's the one that, you know, when you when you plug in the, the, the GPS, you see the very routes there. You find that the ones that are very short, you probably need to pay some money somewhere. And that's why it's short. If you decide, I don't want to pay that price, then you take the long route. The same thing goes with the supernatural. Supernatural just shortens the journey. It makes things so easy for you. Immediately, they got, they arrived at their destination because Jesus got into that boat. The Bible says, in the same John says, it says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his seal on him. What is it saying? Don't put more energy into natural things than you do the supernatural. Put in more energy. I keep saying, my jack your day. When you wake up in the day, don't start running around. Put in more effort into spirituality. Bring the spiritual things into your natural world. Then you do things that can perish. The more time you spend with God, the less energy you expend on your natural day-to-day -day activity. I said, when I was in school, I need to read so much, and once I get overwhelmed, I know it's time to go to God. Anytime. I can't finish this thing. How do I go about it? I'll just close the book and go to the Bible. I'll just read some chapters. I'll go back to my book. And each time I get to like a chapter, something inside me will say, don't read that. Then I'll skip. Once that exam comes, the only thing that comes out are the things I read. He shortens your journey when you give him your time. Verse 28, John 6 says, Then they said to him, What shall we do? that we may work the works of God. And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. If you ask me, what should I do? That's what they were asking Jesus. Believe. And I'm telling you, believing God is work. Especially in this kind of life. Believing in him is really work. And so you've got to do seven things to believe God. And so talking about creating the supernatural. The first thing you believe is it is possible. Say to yourself, it is possible. Say it loud. It is possible. You know, because one thing that works against us is the thoughts that seven things are impossible. If you can believe, it is possible. And it takes work for you to believe it is possible. Florence Nightingale said, I attribute my success to this. I never gave or accept any excuse. I never, I, I personally don't believe something is not possible. Years ago, I was very, I was going to, I was preparing for my first concert. I was still, I think I was, I was like 20 or 21, I don't remember. 
I was praying for a concert. I didn't have a job, I didn't have money, I didn't know people, and I wanted this to be a grand success. So the first thing I did was, I needed to get a place, of course, to be able to even own the concert. And so I brought together some of my friends, the people that were going to back up and things like that. And they asked me, so, why can I go to you? I said, well, let's go and book the hotel. I said, they said, hotel, where's the money to book the hotel? I said, let's get the hotel first. And so, they asked me what hotel. At that point, there was this very gigantic hotel in uh, Nigeria. It's called Presidential Hotel. So what I told them, we were doing the Presidential Hotel. I saw them, they didn't want to laugh to my face. I didn't have money. I wanted to use the, the guest hotel in the land. And so they looked at me. They didn't say anything. They know I love faith. So they didn't want to discourage my faith, but they could not hide the mockery. I could see them kind of smirking. I said, what's that? I said, they said, ah, yeah, yeah, we're, we're using presidential hotel. I said, yeah. I said, it's possible. They said, yeah, it's, it's possible. It's, it's you talking, so we believe it's possible. So I said, that's what we're going to use. They said, okay. So, we picked the date for the concert. We went to the hotel. When the manager saw us, looked at our shoes. He was like, what are these guys doing? So I said, ah, uh, we actually want to hold a concert in this place. We can't look at our shoes again. We want to hold a concert in this place, in this hotel. I said, yes. He didn't even ask the date. He just went ahead and told us the facts of the hall. So I was like, okay. He said, did you hear me? I said, yeah. He said, when is there concert? I told him, he just nodded, he just shook his head and said, it's too late. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that use this hotel, they book like a year or two years ahead. I said, did they pick that date that I'm supposed to do the concert? He said, I'm telling you that we already have next year all booked. I said, okay, can I check your calendar? The guy said, what are you talking about? I said, I want to see that date. And I want to know who picked that date. He said, are you not talking about next month? I said, yes. He said, Every, it's booked still, you know, two years. I said, I just, just show me. I just need to see it. And then he took me to his office and we sat down. He was, he was laughing. I was just saying, you know, like, I mean, his head was the same. This girl was really stubborn. And so the old, he started opening, was showing me, look at, see, booked. He said, like, from, the, from two years, so that I can see how the book. When he got to my date, somebody booked that date, but a day, the previous night, the person canceled. So he saw that it was booked, but there was, a, there was a cancellation on that booking. The guy did this. It's not possible. He looked at it again. I said, I told you, I need to use this hotel that day. The guy was just shaking his head. He now said, but what about the money? I said, just book me. I'm not paying now, but I'm coming to pay. Just book me. I'm using this hotel that day. So I left. I didn't have a con I didn't even have uh, musical instruments. I didn't, the basic things I showed, how come I didn't even have them? And so I announced again to my group that we needed the, um, the guests of honor. So they asked me who the guest of honor would be. I said, the one was the governor. But because of what had happened with the hotel, they no longer doubted anything. Actually, they thought I already had it planned out. Maybe I already, you know, prepared certain things. So they didn't believe in me more. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready to explain to them what I was doing. I went to the governor's office. They didn't even let me into the gates. Let me talk about the office. So I got there and said, I want to see the governor's wife. They said, do you have an appointment? I said, no. They said, what do you want? I said, I'm trying to invite her. They all looked at me. 
to where? I said to my concert. They said, your concert, what's your name? So they needed to know whether I'm one of the celebrities or not. I told them my name. Of course, they've never heard my name. So they said, you want the governor's wife to come to your concert? I said, yes. So they said, come another time. I said, I don't need to come another time. I'm going to drop you guys the letter. Please make sure it gets to her. And I left. So what I started doing from that day is, you know, I was in a fast. Every day, I would just tell God, thank God for the hall. Thank God for the instruments. Thank God for the wife of the governor. One day I was praying, I used to go to one, you know, abandoned building to go and pray. But people know I go there. So one day I was praying and I saw somebody, you know, peeping through the window. So I was wondering what that was about. So I went outside and the person asked, are you from oh, AKK? Okay, okay. I said, yes. He said, you have a letter. So I handed over the letter to me. I looked at the envelope from the office of the governor's wife. I opened it. The governor's wife said, she will be there. I went crazy. I was just, but I was by myself. I was just jumping up. I was just, you know, I stopped the prayer. I rushed to one of the, you know, houses of my group members. And I told them, I said, governor's wife is coming. And then they looked at me and said, but we have no paid for the form. I said, the governor's wife is coming. That's all that matters to me now. That evening I was in the church and I was leading the praise and worship and I gave the testimony. I told them how we got that hall and how we, the governor's wife is coming. So after service, one woman called me and said, have you paid, have you booked the hall? I said, no. She said, the governor's wife is coming and you have the date. I should pay for the hall. And she wrote me a check. Another guy called me and told me he knows somebody who sells musical instruments. Do I want to use a brand new set? I said, I don't buy it. He gave me a note to go get the instruments. Because the governor's wife was coming, they started advertising on the radio and the TV that she's going to be at a concert. So I did not need to gather people anymore by energy. The hall was jammed. People didn't have a place to sit because someone believes that she doesn't need to give excuses or take one. If you believe it's possible, you will do whatever it takes. You will start acting like it's already done. You don't give excuses and you don't take them. You don't say, hey, I'm tired. You don't say, I cannot do this. You can make it. When my daughter was in grade, I think mean, 11th grade, she came home one day and said, Mom, the election of the student uh, uh, student uh, council president is coming. I asked her, what's your business? She said, I would have wanted to be one. I looked at her and said, you're just 14 or 15? She said, yes. I said, so be one if you want to be. She now laughed and said, I can't. I said, what do you mean by you can't? She said, it's only for the popular kids. You've got to be popular to be able to do it. So I told her, then be popular. She said, how do I do that? I asked her, do you want me to make you popular? She said, Lock, she said, mom, stop joking around. I said, just answer me. Do you want me to make you popular in your school? She said, the election is next week. I said, the one week is too much. I'll make you popular. She said, OK. I said, OK. She went for a photo shoot. I sent her pictures to my graphic artist. They wrote all manner of stuff. I made, you know, students were using paper, crayon to do stuff. No, I did 3D flyers. Not 10, not 20. 400. I told all her siblings, tomorrow morning we're going to school. 7 a.m. 
We're not handing these flyers to students, we're handing them to parents. And we wrote all manner of stuff. This is an A stuff. This is a valedictorian kind of thing. Make a change in the school. We want this. So there's not one flyer. I mean, different concepts, different pictures, and different things. We stood at the gate and we handed the flyer. So the parents were saying, Who is this girl? So they were saying, Oh, is this some nerd? We said it. The parents said, You should vote for this girl. You should vote for this girl. In one week, Zolima became the student council president at 14. Because she was already on that trip, so she naturally, when she finished at 15, she was the valedictorian. Because it is possible. You just need to tell yourself it is possible. I'm not given an excuse and I'm not taking one. It is possible. That was what Florence Nightingale said. I read that this very early this morning and I said, this is good because it is possible. And I know what she's talking about. When you believe it is possible. I like the scripture in Mark 10, 27 that says, with God all things are possible. But I even prefer the one in Mark 9, 23. Mark 9, 23 says, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. That is to say, God can do everything. But even to you who believes, all things are possible. There's absolutely nothing you cannot achieve. You can have your children excel beyond their imagination. When my son came and said he wanted to do medicine, I'm like, why don't you do what is okay? And she looked, looked at me and said, Mom, I'm shocked that you're the one talking like that because I know you. I said, okay. He went to TSU and was changing major. We changed on this, changed to this. So I looked at him and said, this guy is not serious. Is this how you're going to do medicine? How, do you, how are you going to do this? By the time he was ready for MCAT, he was doing certain things that even me have never done before. He became consistent. He put on his wall the score he needed to get. He got a trainer. He got somebody to help him to write all his essays. See, he was very systematic. You know, he, he wasn't just like, I want to go. No, this was business for him. It was serious business for him. By the time he did his impact, it was in the 97th percentile. Four Ivy Leagues called him before he chose that one. Because it is possible. There's absolutely nothing you want in this world that is not possible. All you need to do is to exchange, the exchange program, and believe that it's possible. And always tell yourself it's possible. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When people ask, do you have faith? Faith is not just believing. You've got to, faith has a proof. What the substance? I wanted to have a, all the concert. I wasn't praying and assuming that the hall would be booked. I took a step of faith and went there. Against all odds, I moved there and asked them, I need a book because that was the evidence that I believed I was going to do it. If you believe that you want something done, Begin to do something like it was, it's already done. Act on it. By faith we understand that the world, this world that was framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of feasible, feasible things. God did not look for something to create this world. He said, let there be light. He spoke. So the things you're seeing were not made by things that you see. They were made out of things that you do not see. And the Bible says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. You cannot have an exchange program if you don't believe it's going to happen. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe that God is committed to that exchange. If I'm praying about something, you must believe. 
that God is going to do it. And how do you believe? How do you show it? Because it's a, there must be an evidence. What's the proof? If you say, I want this to work, what is the proof? That it's going to work. What are you doing to make it work? Without works, faith is dead. You've got to do something to make sure that it's working. The next thing I said, you must believe it's possible. You must believe it's possible. Number two, change your perspective. Change how you see things. See, um, if you, wherever you're seated, you can only see a part of me. If you come to sit here, you're going to see another side of me. If you're sitting behind, you're going to see another side, isn't it? Change your perspective. If you have been limiting your vision before, try to see whatever you're seeing now from another angle. Change your perspective. One day I was taking my daughter to school uh, a few years ago, and that was so beautiful. Why? Because anytime I'm approaching the lights, it goes green. And there were a lot of lights. So it got me excited. So I was always looking forward to the lights. I was not it's red from a distance, but the moment I hit that place, it goes great. Then I'll laugh. And my daughter was saying, Mom, are you why are you doing like you're crazy? I said, lights are going green. So I told them, those lights know I'm coming. All of a sudden, we got into uh, the streets of our school and a car was blocking the entrance to our school. And I felt, oh God, this person is going to mess the day. Why is she parking there? Why is she blocking the entrance? And it looked like she was even on her phone. And it, I was about to come in out of my car to go tell her, you need to move your car. And I said, no, let me see how I can, you know, navigate and go into the school. Once I moved close to the car, I discovered she was not blocking the entrance at all. She was at, as much as she was far. But because I was looking at the car from a particular angle, it felt like she was blocking. And that almost messed my day up. Until I got to another side, and I saw that, oh, this is not as bad as I thought it was. Until you change your perspective, your life doesn't change. The Bible speaking in 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as men see. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God does not look at things the way they are. He looks beyond. And that will help change your perspective. If you start seeing things, and this morning we're doing the shadow and some such. I said, you may see several things as a shadow, but if you look deeper, there may actually be sunshine in that shadow. But if you want to hold on to the shadow, then you get depressed. Change your perspective, and things will change. A hot dog. It's not the dog. And it's not even hot at times. The fact that it's called hot dog does not mean it's a dog. And it doesn't mean it's hot. Things are not the way they appear to be. Somebody told me once, met me once, she followed somebody to see me. I was in my office back in Nigeria. And so I started gisting them, and they were just crack. I was not cracking up because I was just saying different things. They were laughing and laughing and laughing. So at the end of the day, uh, one of them looked at me and said, "People don't know you, do they?" I said, "Why?" He said, "Actually, when I was coming here, I wanted to confirm something." I said, "What happened?" They said, "Somebody said they have never seen someone as arrogant as I am." I said, "For real?" This, she said, "Yes." I said, the people that say that, have they met me? She said, that's what I doubt. 
I said, they've only seen me on the billboard, right? I said, yes. I said, how can you look at the billboard and, this, and just come to a conclusion of arrogance when they don't know nothing? She said, it's amazing. I said, who actually said that? She said, she not mentioned somebody that I know. I said, oh, I understand why they said that. She said, what happened? I said, one day I was in a hall, I was teaching some people, and I was told, somebody sent me a note that my car brushed another person's car. So I was wondering what happened, because I had a driver. So I, I assumed my driver was playing hanky-panky downstairs or something. So I said, okay, let me finish my message and I'll come downstairs. So when I got downstairs, I looked at my car. I saw that something really happened. I looked at the other person's car. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. They said it was my PA that did something. I said, okay, let's not talk about this thing. So I asked them, how much will it take to fix the car? That was the statement that was perceived as being arrogant. And I can see why they would think it's arrogant. I was in a hurry to go back upstairs to continue my message. So I needed to get it over with. So I felt, it's, let's just use money and settle this thing so I can go. Not that, not because I wanted to look down on them. It was just that I needed to get, but they didn't understand this, you know, the situation and they saw it as being arrogant. So, sometimes we see people and we come to a conclusion but things are not always the way they see. When you see somebody frowning, they're not frowning because they don't like you. Something else may have been going on somewhere. One day my husband was calling and I picked the call and I remembered I needed something. So I told him I needed something and he told me, I don't think you can get it. And I felt, what do you mean by it? you can't get it? And he kept telling me, you know what, you know, I'll call you back. And that pissed me off. I was like, what's going on? And I went to God, and God said this. It is not always the way it seems. The next morning, he sent the money to my account. So I called. I said, what's going on? He said, yesterday, we were calling while I was in a meeting. So I just needed to be dismissed. I, I should have picked the call, but I didn't want to feel bad. So I picked the call. Now, I wasn't seeing what was going on at the end of the line, so I just came to a conclusion. Things are not always the way the same. It's arrogance to think this world is all about you. Everything is about you. If somebody sneezes, they are sneezing because you passed. If somebody smiles, they are making fun of you. That's arrogance. The world is not all about you. Things don't always, you know, be, they're not like the way they appear to be. So change your perspective. I love what Sir Blue Mandy says. Say, when you shift your perspective, suddenly the life you are living changes. Things will just change. The moment you just switch, when you switch your perspective or when you shift it, the life you are living changes. Simply Mandy. Another thing, don't self-sabotage. The Bible says here, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. I'm still talking about creating the supernatural. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Don't self-sabotage. Don't pray for something and start acting differently. Don't say something to people and start believing in your mind that it will not happen. Let your prayer and your thought process agree. If you're praying for a child to be well, and you say, Father, please heal my child, 
think the child is well. Don't start doing certain things that runs contrary to what you just prayed about. If you say my home is stable, don't begin to shake it. Don't shake your relationship. I was watching a show yesterday and I saw a couple that were uh, they, they're dating. They, they were having terrible, you know, storms coming against their relationship. And they said they were going to stay together to make sure they overcome the storm. And one day, the guy looked at the woman and said, can I trust you? That was self-sabotaging. She looked at him and said, after all we've been through, you're asking if I'm, I'm worthy of your trust. And that was the end of the relationship. He sabotaged that relationship. Don't be self-sabotaging. I heard from Corinne Selby. He says self-sabotage is when we say we want something, then we go about to make sure it doesn't happen. Can you relate to this? Can you relate to that? You want something, but every action shows that you don't want it. You're making sure this is not going to happen. Your action does not align to what you have told yourself will happen. It's self-sabotage. If I say I want to, I'm coming this morning, I'm going to talk to people about certain things, I need to get up. I need to prepare the message. I need to make sure the place is okay. I need to make sure things happen. I can't do something contrary to that. Everything I do must be in alignment with what I said will happen. You can't say I need you know, to, to always come to church. And on, on Saturday night, you are in a club. You know, some people will text me in the morning saying, you know, sorry, we can't make it this morning. I'll say, why? Yeah, you know, we had a long night. Where? At the downtown. I'm like, you didn't want to come. If you didn't want to come, you'll make sure that nothing sabotages your being here. You, you, don't, you can't say, I want to go for an interview in the morning, and then you start making out at night with your friends. You're sabotaging what you want to do. You can't say you want to pass in school and you now begin to, you know, to play around with your books. That's self-sabotaging. You can't say you want a good and a stable relationship and then you start doing things that people that want to be committed are not supposed to do. That is self-sabotaging. Make sure that you put your money where you want to feed or shop from. Let everything come together. Don't self-sabotage. Because if you're alone, you're going to have a problem. Finally, change your narrative. The story you tell about an event changes who you are and how you feel. If you're telling me a story, because I hear stories every time, when you tell the story, the way you tell that story changes who you are. Then who you are and how you feel also can change the stories. If I'm very sad and I'm telling you a story, the story is going to come across as very sad. Because that's the way I'm feeling. If I'm excited and I'm telling you a bad story, you're not going to feel the trauma in that story. Because I am not what I am talking about. I've, I've overcome it. So I don't feel that way. So if you want to feel well, change your narrative. Change it. And I'll give you an example. That is me. Did you see what the police officer is trying to do? He's looking for a bullet in my head. Why? Because when my car was shot,
This is my headrest. The bullet came from behind, came from, you know, came out of here and popped out that cushion. And my head was there. And I was driving. So when the police came, these are just a few of the pictures. The whole of my car had bullet holes. So my daughter looked at me and said, Mom, is the bullet in your hair? So I tried to do this, and then the policeman came. I was trying to check whether the bullet was there. Of course the bullet was not there. When I narrate this story, I am not looking for sympathy. When I narrate the story, I am not trying to give you the headlines of all the news. I don't want to say there's news today. When I narrate this story, I want you to see that the supernatural is possible. That I was in a car, I was driving, I was shot, but I became invisible. Because not one bullet touched me. And the bullets were not even found. Not in the car and not on my head. Just definitely. When you change the narrative of your story, it makes you feel better if you say it from a positive light. So when people come to narrate a story, I tell them to say the story again. I tell them to tell me the story again. The more they tell me that story, the more I see that things are shifting. And at some point, they will begin to tell the story from a victory point and not from a victim point. Change your narrative. The same story, but make sure that when you're telling the story, begin to narrate it as the narrator and not as the story itself. You are not the story. You are just the narrator of that story. I don't know if you understand what I mean. When you're telling a story, assume you're outside the story and you're telling the story of maybe somebody else. It helps you better to, because when you're watching a movie, you as the audience, Sometimes you already know what you, the person in that story should do because you are seeing it from different angle. You are not your story. You are not your story. You are in your story, but you are not your story. Be the narrator of your story. Stay outside and talk about it so that people don't think or you don't invite pity party. You want people to see how bad it is. Narrate it. Because when you narrate it that way, you externalize. So when people are depressed, somebody told me, when my depression comes. I said, what do you mean by my depression? Did they put your name on depression? No. It comes and goes. When depression comes, when anxiety comes, if you learn to externalize your issues and your problems, you are able, armed, capable to handle that problem. And so you can create a supernatural in that problem. Be the narrator and not the story. Narrate your story. Sad, bad, fearful, narrate it. Just be your narrator. When you're saying it to people, when you're telling yourself, sometimes when I'm even telling my story, I use things like, and then Falake went somewhere. <laughs> it makes me see what is going on and I'm able to address the issue better because I am not that story. That story does not define me. That story is not my destiny. That story is just an event that happened and I happen to be in that event. But that is not me. 
That's not where I'm going to end. I'm just talking about a chapter in my life. It's not the whole book. Because every event is just part of you. That's not the whole of you. I'm not ending there. I'm just passing by. And so it's just a clip. And so and I'm narrating it. Because I'm also the author. I can change it. I can change the story. If somebody else is narrating the story of when I was shot, you say, oh, and then she was shot. Only God knows what is happening to her now. Maybe she's traumatized. Maybe she's going to have PTSD. They are writing their own story. If I'm going to write the story, I'm going to say I was shot. Nothing happened. That is to say, if God can do that for me, he can even do much more. I'm narrating the story. That is the way I want you to handle your life. Remember, it is possible. Believe it. Never, never self-sabotage yourself. Don't do that to you. Change your perspective and be your narrator. Change your narrative and things will be there. Questions? <laughs>